Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the National Housing Conference 2023. My name is Michael Fotheringham. I'm the Managing Director of the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, AHURI, and it's my great pleasure to be the convener and host of this conference. Many of you will already be familiar with the work of AHURI, we're Australia's national independent research organisation dedicated to housing, homelessness, cities and urban research. Our peer-reviewed research is globally respected and it's used by all levels of Australian governments to support policy and decision making and by community sectors and industry to drive improvement across the housing and homelessness sectors. We have an enormous program over the next three days, so much to talk about, so many great people to hear from. But before I introduce the conference and this morning's speakers, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Chris Dawson. Chris is an emerging Aboriginal leader who lives here in Brisbane, where he's linked to the Turbul people through bloodline and kinship ties. He's here today on behalf of, and with the blessing of, his auntie, Turbul elder, Songwoman Maruchi Baramba. Songwoman Maruchi had intended to be here, but was unexpectedly unable to make it, so we're very grateful that Chris has stepped in to welcome us to country. Please welcome. Chris Dawson. I want to be, I want to begin today by verbally welcome you all on Turubu Yagara Jagara traditional lands, which we are gathered here to, for today's ceremony. I'd like to welcome all elders that have travelled to be here today, and I pay my respects to all elders, past, present, and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. My name is Chris Dawson. I was born here in Mianjin, Anala. I was taught culture at a young age, and I'm a songman from Mianjin, and I share kinship ties with the Turubu Jagara Nation. I'm here on behalf of my Aunty Elder from Turubu Nation. Her name is Aunty Maruchi, and she is also a songwoman which I'll speak on her behalf today for the Turubu people. In the Turubu language, we say Borukari Maramba Mianjinu, and that means welcome to Brisbane, and we call Brisbane Mianjin. Can everyone say Mianjin? Mianjin. Mianjin, and that means the place of water lilies. Now I'm going to sing a welcome song called Garing in an Army to traditionally welcome you here on this country. <clears throat> And this song here comes from the Waka Waka Gabi Gabi people. Yo carring in the name, do jam obre yo no carring in the name, carring in the name, I do jam obre yo no. Garing in the name, I do jam obre yo no. Garing in the name, do jam obre yo no. Gaya mama rangai, gaya mama rangai, jagangunga yo no. Gaya mama rangai, jagangunga yo no. Gaya mama rangai, jagangunga yo no. Garing in the name, garing in the name, I do jam obre yo no. Garing in the name, I do jam obre yo no. Hur, hur, cha. Thank you. So I just want to say, um, from a cultural perspective, welcome to countries is the modern terminology we say to get welcome on tribal lands, but it's actually cultural protocols our ancestors followed when getting welcome into another tribe or clan group when we did ceremonies. This whole country, Australia, we call home, but there is over 400 different countries, tribes in Australia. So welcomes are very important. So once again, welcome and safe travels on your journey for the next three days. Thank you so much, Chris. 
I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre now stands and the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the conference. I offer my respect to Elders past and present and acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's connections to land, sea and community and, their res and respect their cultural, spiritual and educational practices. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which virtual attendees are participating uh, for, with, with the conference this week. Now, I'd like to welcome our ministerial speakers joining us in the conference. The Honourable Julie Collins, MP, Federal Minister for Housing and Homelessness. We'll hear from Minister Collins in a few minutes. The Honourable Megan Scanlon, MP, Queensland Minister for Housing. We'll hear from Minister Scanlon tomorrow in the midst of a busy sitting week. And I'd also like to acknowledge our international speakers. Sorcha Edwards, the Secretary General of Housing Europe, who we are delighted to have with us in a plenary session tomorrow. Steve Lucas, Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public and Indian Housing from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Professor Jim Dunn from the Canadian Housing and Evidence Collaborative and McMaster University. And Ed Mays, Development Director for Silvertown in the UK. And the many speakers from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We do, of course, have many wonderful Australian speakers as well, and I'd like to particularly extend my welcome to all the people who are participating in the conference with lived experience of housing vulnerability, who are part of the conference program and part of the delegates. Your voices are really important to shaping better outcomes for housing futures. We're grateful to Mission Australia, this year's bursary partner, providing bursaries to enable 17 people with lived experience to attend the conference this year, uh, with both in-person and virtual registrations. And thank you all for making the time to be here for the 13th National Housing Conference. It's a fitting day for this conference to begin. It's both World Homelessness Day and International Mental Health Day. And as we all know, a well-balanced, coordinated housing system enhances the quality of life for a whole nation and it can help end homelessness and provides an important foundation for mental health. Uhuri convenes the National Housing Conference every two years to help frame the national conversation in housing policy and practice. In fact, we had plans to have the, the 12th National Housing Conference here in Brisbane, originally scheduled for 2021. Now, for obvious reasons, that didn't happen, uh, so we deferred the conference until today. We were fortunate, though, to be able to bring in an extra conference, to squeeze one in last year, the 12th National Housing Conference in Melbourne, in the reopening in Melbourne. For many of us, it was the first opportunity to meet in person after a couple of really hard years. So it's only been a year and a half since the last National Housing Conference, and in other times I might be worried that not enough has happened, not enough time has passed between conferences that we might not have enough to talk about, but that's not the concern today. A lot's going on. With housing has never been more prominent than it is in, in public discussion and, and conversations today. Um, so it is, is a top priority for governments right across the country. Since we last met, there's been a change of federal government. The list of announcements on housing have been made at both federal and state level is enormous, too long for me to list. Um, and Australia is grappling with a range of different housing system challenges. While many of these have been building for decades, for a lot of them have reached a flashpoint. So we need to move beyond short-term thinking, silver bullets, um, and implement long-term multifaceted programs that address complex housing challenges and see improvements to Australian housing outcomes. We need to find a way forward. At this 13th National Housing Conference, we come together as representatives from right across the housing sector, bringing diverse perspectives to complex challenges. We're excited to, to present NHC as a hybrid conference again in 2023, and those who are participating online are once again getting a full experience hearing directly from our speakers and have the opportunity to be part of the conversation and ask questions using the conference portal, while delegates here in the room will have the additional benefits of networking with colleagues during the breaks. I'm sure you've all had a chance to study the conference program. Uh, this week, across 40 official conference sessions, around 160 speakers will tackle a whole range of issues. The national policy context, how other countries with federated systems of government are managing private rental markets, uh, how, how we'll explore a way forward for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing. We'll look to Europe to learn how we might respond to the impacts of climate change and draw on leading practice in decarbonisation of housing and we'll draw together lessons and conversations across the conference to consider a way forward for housing in Australia. Those are just the plenary sessions. Beyond those, you'll, we'll have a wealth of choices as you might consider which major concurrent and think tank, se tank sessions you want to attend. With so much fascinating content, you'll want to schedule your time carefully. And that's why the NHC 2023 St George Community Housing Conference portal is there to, to allow you to curate your own program by saving the sessions, bookmarking the sessions you want to attend. 
If you haven't accessed it already, use the, the personal login details you received yesterday by email. And if you have any trouble accessing the portal, the information booth outside, the Ahuri staff and volunteers in the black and the green T-shirts are happy to help. If you have any questions in any of the hybrid sessions, those marked virtual in the program, you can use the portal whether you're here in person or attending virtually. But for those of you who are in the audience, we will also have mics running to allow you to actually to have your voice heard directly. We'll be making available all of the presentation decks from all of the, all of the sessions and videos from all of the virtual sessions on our websites in the coming weeks. It's taken the support of many organisations and individuals, in, individuals to bring the National Housing Conference together again this year, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of our major partners. I want to express my appreciation to our conference host sponsor, supporter, Queensland Government, and in fact thank all of the state and territory governments for their continuing partnership and support of this national conversation. Thanks also to our gold partners, Civica, who are returning for the third conference in a row, sponsoring the popular think tank, St George Community Housing, our technology partner, making virtual attendance possible. Q Shelter, host of the Networking Lounge, perhaps one of the most important elements of the experience after a couple of years of COVID disruption. And Mission Australia, who, as I mentioned, are sponsoring the bursary program. Thank you to all of the conference sponsors, and I encourage you to take, your, take the opportunity to have a look through the exhibition hall. It's bigger than ever. It's now my pleasure to invite to the stage our opening ministerial speaker, the Honourable Julie Collins MP, Federal Minister for Housing. Julie was first elected as a representative for Franklin in 2007 and throughout her career has worked to improve the lives of others. Julie's held numerous portfolios in both government and opposition and is in fact in her second stint as Minister for Housing, having held the position in 2013 as well. She's currently Minister for Housing, Minister for Homelessness, taking on a bold government agenda overseeing, national, uh, overseeing development of a national housing and homelessness plan, the delivery of the HAF, a help to buy program and much more and she's also the Minister for Small Business. Please welcome Minister Julie Collins. Wow, thank you, Michael, for that very warm welcome. I too want to begin by acknowledging traditional owners on whose land we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations people who are with us today in person or online. And I reiterate our government's commitment to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the Voice and I particularly want to thank Chris Dawson for his lovely, generous welcome to country today. As many of you know, housing has been identified as a key policy area that The Voice would focus on so we can deliver real improvements for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'd like to thank uh, Dr Michael Fotheringham and the Uhuru team for inviting me to deliver the keynote address this morning. Can I say how fabulous it is to be in a room with so many people who are so passionate about housing? As Michael has said, it's been just over 18 months since Uhuru last, ha hosted the last National Housing Conference. And as he also said, a lot has happened since that last virtual conference in Melbourne. So I'm sure you're excited to be here. And of course, just a few months after your last conference, our government was elected. We're elected with a series of policies to help transform housing in Australia. And I'm proud that we've already undertaken a significant amount of that work to make these policies a reality. But given the serious challenges that we have inherited in housing, we haven't just been progressing that agenda that we took to the last election. We've also been adding to it at every opportunity as things have changed. So today, I do want to reflect on all of the work that we've undertaken to date, but I also want to share with you where we're heading and how the expertise of people like all of you in this room and across the housing sector will continue to be critical in our government's decision making. We want to bring everyone together because we know partnerships are fundamental to getting things done to turn around these housing challenges. And we know this action is so important. When the government came to office just over a year ago, we inherited the housing system in need of serious repair, as many of you know. The housing market is too difficult, sadly, for many Australians to enter. Too many Australians are experiencing or facing homelessness. And I'm sure the numbers are not new for all of the people in this room, but they do tell a story. The intergenerational report recently said that for those aged between 30 and 34 years, home ownership fell by 18 percentage points from 1981 to 2021. You all know around 122,000 people were estimated to be homeless on the last census night. 
and nearly half, or 46.7 per cent, of low-income earners who rent spend more than 30 per cent of their weekly income on housing costs. Behind these statistics are people, people living with real consequences, and we all have to do better. There are people like Laurie, whose story I've told in Parliament, who I met on the northwest coast of Tasmania earlier this year. Laurie had just moved in to a new social home, the result of a partnership between the federal government, the Tasmanian government, and Housing Choices Tasmania. Before she'd moved in, Laurie told me her story of how she'd been waiting to secure a home for two years. Two years, every day, putting her life on hold while she waited for a roof over her head. Two years, not knowing where she was sleeping that night or how she was going to feed herself. But having a home has made a big difference. It's the foundation, as we know, for Australians to build a better life. And for Laurie, she told me that her new home meant she could finally go back to school and get the education she'd always wanted. I've heard many stories like this over and over as Minister for Housing and Homelessness. And they are a constant reminder to me of the work that we still need to do to improve housing for more Australians. This is what drives me every day to ensure that our ambitious housing agenda does deliver real change for more Australians facing housing challenges. We know that this agenda needs to be substantial, and it is, and we know it needs to be ambitious, and it is, because it has to be. This is why we've already acted in several crucial areas. In 2022, we of course announced the National Housing Accord. The Accord brought together all levels of government, institutional investors and representatives for the, from the residential construction sector to agree actions to unlock affordable quality housing supply over the medium term. As part of the Accord, we agreed with our partners to set a national aspirational target to build one million new well-located homes over five years from 2024. And as many of you know, then in August 2023, National Cabinet, which brings together the Commonwealth, the states and the territories, agreed to extend this target to 1.2 million homes well located over five years. At this meeting of the National Cabinet, we also agreed to a national planning reform blueprint to help meet this target. This includes actions to unlock housing supply, improve affordability, changes such as planning, zoning, land release and other reforms. At that National Cabinet meeting, the Albanese Labor Government also committed $3 billion in performance-based funding under what's called the New Homes Bonus. The New Homes Bonus will pay state and territory governments for delivering more than their share of the 1.2 million well-located homes agreed to under the National Housing Accord. This will help states to boost housing supply and increase housing affordability across the country. This will also have support of the $500 million housing support program to assist local and state governments to meet these ambitious housing targets. The program will fund things like connecting essential services or building amenities to support new housing developments. This program is about making sure we have the essential services, community infrastructure and planning capability to make these happen. The National Cabinet at that meeting also agreed to a better deal for renters to harmonise and strengthen renters' rights across Australia. This includes developing a nationally consistent policy to require genuine, reasonable grounds for eviction, moving towards limiting rent increases to once a year, phasing in minimum rental standards. These changes will make a tangible impact for the almost one third of Australians who rent. The National Cabinet made nine recommendations around improving rights for renters and more consistency. Then in our May budget, we also included new initiative to support the supply of rental housing by improving taxation arrangements for investments such as build to rent accommodation. And our government has already helped around 1.1 million Australians with the rising cost of rent by increasing the maximum level rates of the Commonwealth rent assistance by 15%, an investment of $2.7 billion over five years. And of course, last month, we saw the culmination of many months of collaborative debate and engagement by so many of you in this room when the Senate and indeed the Parliament passed the Housing Australia Future Fund. The $10 billion fund will be the single biggest investment in affordable and social housing in more than a decade from a federal government. Importantly, it will be secure, ongoing pipeline of funding for social and affordable rental housing that will help generations of Australians. 
The Housing Australia Future Fund will help deliver the government's commitment of 30,000 new social and affordable rental homes in the fund's first five years. This includes 4,000 of the homes for women and children impacted by family and domestic violence and older women who are at risk of homelessness. You will have seen that we're also committed to building more social housing through our $2 billion social housing accelerator. This accelerator will deliver thousands of new social homes across Australia with state governments. This funding has already been delivered to the states and territories. They have the money so they can start investing in building new homes right now. The states and territories have some flexibility in how they permanently boost their social housing stock under the social housing accelerator. We've included new builds, expanding programs and renovating or refurbishing existing but currently uninhabitable stock. The states are required and the territories to commit all of that funding to have expended it or contracted it by the 30th of June 2025 to help deliver these rental homes for people on social housing waiting lists across the country as soon as we can. And you'll have seen a recent announcement by the Prime Minister and the New South Wales Premier about how this is going to work in New South Wales. And we have more announcements coming in days and weeks from other states and territories. In our last budget, we also increased the liability cap of the National Housing Finance Investment Corporation. And I'm pleased to say that that will re soon be renamed Housing Australia in just a few days' time. Indeed, uh, NIFIC's uh, liability cap has been increased by $2 billion to $7.5 billion. This will be used to provide lower cost housing and long-term finance to community housing providers through the Affordable Housing Bond Aggregator. And I saw firsthand how this works when I was in Brisbane just in August. I went to visit the Blue Chip uh, organisation, Queensland Government and Affordable Housing Bond Aggregator pro Program that delivered social apartments for job seekers and single parents. And it was terrific to talk to those individuals again about how this is changing lives. Last year, of course, we widened immediately the remit of the National Housing Infrastructure Facility and we made available immediately that $575 million to directly support more social and affordable housing to enable more housing to be built. We have homes under construction today because we made that decision. We also committed recently an additional $1 billion in funding to the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to build even more social housing for Australians who need it while we wait for the returns from the Housing Australia Future Fund. We also, of course, committed to the one-year extension of the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, providing approximately $1.7 billion for the one year of 2023-24 to the states and territories for housing and homelessness services. This agreement included an additional $67.5 million to assist funding for the sector to help tackle the increase in homelessness challenges as part of that one-year extension. We also, of course, have expanded the Home Guarantee Scheme, and people have seen that in the news yesterday and today, to help more Australians into home ownership. Last year, we introduced the Regional First Home Buyer Guarantee three months early as part of this scheme, and it's already helped thousands of Australians into home ownership in regional Australia. Indeed, under our government, the Home Guarantee Scheme has already supported more than 73,000 people across the country to purchase homes sooner by reducing the deposit they need to save for a home. And we're helping even more Australians into home ownership with the expanded eligibility criteria that changed on 1st of July of this year. We now have any two eligible borrowers that can make a joint application under the scheme. These guarantees are open to eligible non-first home buyers who haven't owned a property in Australia in the last 10 years as well. So that's opening up to people that have been out of the private ownership for some time. It also includes social and affordable homes through the Housing Australia Future Fund and the affordable housing that will be delivered through the National Housing Accord. The new programs and Housing Australia's stewardship to them will be critical to addressing housing challenges over the longer term, but they're also critical that we have the right strategy in place to drive the, the work of Housing Australia. And that's where I want to appeal to you all directly. As many of you are aware, earlier this year, our government kicked off consultations on the new National Housing and Homelessness Plan. Indeed, the plan will identify short, medium and long-term steps that can be taken to help address housing issues in Australia. My goal is for the plan to deliver a better understanding of the current state of housing and homelessness in Australia. We want it to look at the drivers of homelessness and housing insecurity throughout urban, regional, rural and remote Australia. 
We also wanted to look at housing supply and home ownership. And importantly, my ambition is for the plan to set out, set out a clearer strategy for how all levels of government can work together with the private and the community sector to better support people fa facing housing challenges. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just a little bit out of order here. <laughs> this is what happens when I have so much to say. Whilst I don't want to preempt your thoughts on the plan, I do want the plan to outline what a more inclusive housing system should provide to Australians, and more importantly, how we partner to achieve it. I'm not looking to set up another stopgap plan that must help deliver real change over the next decade. It should be a plan that we can all own, that we all work on together. I want all tiers of government, the private and the community sector, to own the plan together. It's only through such collaboration that we can ensure the plan does that drive real change over the next decade. We need to set out a national vision and a strategy for how we can support those that need it most. I strongly encourage everyone here to contribute as the feedback will be invaluable in helping us understand areas of focus for inclusion in the plan. It is with insights and opinions of experts, industry leaders, state and territory governments and those on the front line that together we'll help deliver a well-informed plan. So if you haven't already, I'd like to encourage all of you in the room to visit the DSS website and contribute your views on the issues paper as a guide. You can share your views by responding in short form questions or lodging a written submission. Consultation is well underway on the plan with multiple events having already taken place in both metropolitan and regional areas across the country. We've held events in Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, Queensland, Tasmania and the ACT to date. And events will be held in the Northern Territory next week and New South Wales the following week. So there's a lot of work to do. Also going forward, of course, we're working on our Help to Buy scheme, uh, our shared equity scheme that many of you will have heard about. It will bring home ownership back into reach for more Australians. We're working to establish the scheme next year to support 40,000 Australian households purchase a home of their own over four years. For states to participate, legislation will need to be passed for the scheme to operate in each jurisdiction. I'm pleased to say that in August, all states agreed at the National Cabinet to progress legislation so the scheme can run nationally. I know that the conference is about a way forward, which is why I'm talking about the future plans. Help to buy the uh, National Housing and Homelessness Plan and of course the new homes bonus. As I said, Housing Australia also is being reformed and it begins officially on the 12th of October this week. As part of that, we also will be developing and helping with the new plan will be the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. As many of you in this room know, and I think Susan Lloyd Howitz is speaking with you today, the Interim Council is already delivering expert advice to government to help guide our housing agenda. This includes the Interim Council's first report on how we can overcome barriers to institutional investment, finance and innovation in housing. Our government knows that institutional investors will also play a key role going forward in delivering more housing supply, which is why we're taking the report seriously. I'd like to thank the Interim Chair, Susan Lloyd Howitz and the Interim Council for their efforts in delivering the, last, the report last month. I also look forward to Susan's presentation later today. Setting up the Interim Council on July 1 showed our government was serious about our housing agenda. But we know that this kind of advice cannot simply be one off or ad hoc, which is why, of course, as part of the Housing Australia package, uh, we also, of course, are announcing that legislation to establish the permanent statutory body will commence in late December, and we're going to appoint the permanent council shortly after that. So that is... Uh, a three stage from that uh, housing legislation, the Housing Australia Future Fund, the permanency of the Supply and Affordability Council, and of course, the permanency of renaming Housing Australia, which is also happening this week. So we're very serious about our agenda. We know that there's a lot more work to do. We know that we all need to be working together. And it's only with people like all of you in this room that we're actually going to get it done. So I'm pleased that uh, we're in a position where we are, that we've had lots of, um, announcements and we've added to our agenda. But can I say that no doubt all of you here share the same passion that I do for turning this around, which is why you've all turned up. Maybe some of you, like me, have experienced public or community housing firsthand. Or maybe you've needed to squeeze as much dollar as you can to make your rent. We know we cannot turn around decades of inaction on our own. It's why we have a long-term plan 
working with others, with the states, with the territories, with the not-for-profit organisations and indeed with the construction sector. We all need to work together on our plan but on all of our policies right across the board to make sure we continue to collaborate to find the best way forward so that more Australians have a safe, affordable place to call home. Thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Minister Collins. Now I want to introduce our conference opening keynote plenary session speaker, Susan Lloyd Hurwitz. As the Minister said, Susan is Chair of the Interim National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. She's also President of Chief Executive Women, a non-executive director of Rio Tinto Limited, a non-executive director of Macquarie Group, a member of the Sydney Opera House Trust, and many other positions. I won't list all of them. Uh, Susan was previously Chief Executive Officer and Board Director of Mervac, Managing Director of LaSalle Investment Management in London and has held executive positions in Australia, the US and Europe. Please welcome Susan Lloyd Hurwitz. <laughs> also joining us on stage is John Engler. John has been CEO of Shelter New South Wales. Uh, since 2020 and he's also the chair of National Shelter and has been instrumental in leading constructive sector dialogue on housing issues. He's been involved in the formation, development and operation of social and affordable and specialist housing for most of his professional life. Please also welcome John Engler. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here at this very important forum today. Now, I also acknowledge the, the, the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today, the Turbul and Jagera people, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. There is no denying the housing crisis that we're in. It's a long-standing crisis, fundamentally driven through not delivering enough housing of all typologies, from social housing right through to market home ownership. And although this crisis is fundamentally about lack of supply, there are many other contributing factors, particularly at the moment, which are driving a more acute crisis. The resumption of migration at some pace, rising interest rates, skills shortages, elevated construction company insolvencies, falling consumer confidence, and cost inflation, just to name a few. And these all combine to create an environment in which prices and rents are accelerating far faster than wages an environment in which rental vacancy is an all-time low and housing approvals are startlingly low. I'm very certain there is no need for me to share with this audience the worrying statistics about this crisis. After all, we've all self-selected to be in this room today. And for clarity, these remarks are my personal remarks. This crisis has been decades in the making, as the minister was saying. And as I prepared for the conference, I came across an article called The Challenge of Housing a Nation. It started with a sentence, housing supply is not kept up with underlying demand, and made some very familiar observations. Many households are spending an increasing proportion of their income on housing. Before going on to diagnose the problem being caused by lack of land supply, planning and approval processes, lack of coordination um, between infrastructure and housing and skill shortages. Does that sound at all familiar? That article was written 15 years ago, and so little has changed. We're still here talking about the same problems, and more and more households are in housing stress. So what I'd like to consider for the next 10 minutes or so is why it matters that we do everything that we can do, as the minister was encouraging us, to work out how to create a more healthy housing market and what we might be able to do to move in that direction. So firstly, what is an unhealthy market? An unhealthy market has periods of rampant price growth, has an inelastic supply response, is overly reliant on an unsupported private market to address most of the shelter needs of Australians, creates scarcity and cannot match the rich expansive demand with a breadth of housing choice. And what we're talking about here isn't a theoretical or an abstract topic. We're talking about homes, not assets. Access to shelter, to a home, 
to a secure home is a basic human right and a basic need. And the lack of a secure home in either a rental or an own format is a significant source of stress for families. Putting our collective effort into developing a more healthy market matters. It matters to the growing cohort of women over 55 who are almost invisibly homeless. It matters to families living in insecure rental accommodation, moving on average every two years and mostly not at their own volition. It matters to those who commute hours every day from where they can afford to live to where they work. It matters to millions of young people who realize that home ownership is increasingly out of their reach. So let's unpack that last thought for just a moment. Ownership of residential real estate in one form or another is a central feature of how our economy and policy settings are set up. And that's both in terms of home ownership and investment. Investment by individuals in private market rental stock is encouraged through the combination of concessional capital gains tax and negative gearing. And those two things focus people on capital gain rather than income, creating a cost of capital imbalance between individual investors and institutions, making it challenging for institutions to provide secure long-term rental options. And our policy and taxation settings are also built on the assumption that for security and retirement, most Australians will need to own their own home. So the norms of our system, right or wrong, whether you agree with them or not, revolve around ownership of real estate in one form or another. Of course, it doesn't have to be that way. There are nations around the world where the norms are different and renting is seen as a viable and not second-rate option to live in a secure home. There are many countries where the level of home ownership is significantly lower than ours and where the norms are that a majority of households rent for their entire real estate journey. Switzerland is a standout example. Only 34% of Swiss people own their own home, despite Switzerland having one of the highest levels of GDP per capita in the OECD. And Germany isn't far behind. But that's not our system, for better or worse, right or wrong. We often talk about home ownership as a single number. You all know the thirds, a third of Australians rent, a third have a mortgage, and a third own their home outright. But that very simplistic categorization masks some really important trends that make the housing crisis more potent for more households. People are renting for longer and longer in their housing journey, and mostly not by choice. In 2006, 31% of 30 to 39 year olds and 22% of 40 to 49 year olds rented. Those figures are now almost 40% and almost 30%. And when there is a growing cohort of people who will be lifelong renters, given ownership affordability challenges, we are, I think, storing up a significant problem in lack of financial security and retirement for millions of Australians. And along the way, many are living with housing stress and many more living in accommodation where they have no security of tenure. When we talk about housing affordability, we often consider just the headline numbers, the proportion of income that needs to be devoted to rent or mortgage, and we know that those headline numbers are not great. On average, the share of income needed to serve as rent, for example, has risen from 26% in 2020 to over 30% today. But again, that average masks the fact that significant housing stress is concentrated in lower income households. Half a million households are in housing stress, and 200,000 of those are paying more than 50% of their income in rent. 160,000 households are on the wait list for social housing, and yet we haven't increased the stock of social housing for over a decade. But that's not the only problem we're trying to solve. The ability to afford a home is clearly important, but so is security of tenure, proximity to jobs, and access to amenity. So what can be done? We need to build a better and more secure private rental sector. There is a deep need for significant capital investment to fund a material increase in the quantity and quality of Australia's rental stock, most of which to date has been provided by individual investors. 
Institutional investors represent an untapped resource with the potential to deploy capital to provide secure income from a secure accommodation designed for renters. And in fact, Australian superannuation funds do very happily invest in residential rental accommodation, but in the US and the UK and not here. This sector is still in its infancy. In the US, institutionally owned residential real estate accounts for 30% of all institutionally owned real estate. That's twice as big as the investment in the office sector and three times as big as the investment in the retail sector. And a cocktail of interventions in the UK grew the institutional investment in residential rental stock from 10 billion pounds to 43 billion pounds over 10 years. There is no reason why we can't do the same thing here. We need to make more efficient use of the middle ring. When we talk about increasing supply, the debate is usually around should we go up or out? More high-rise apartments or more greenfield development? Both have a role to play, but we also need to focus on the middle ring, which already has infrastructure and amenity and has significantly lower density than the outer ring. Just to illustrate the point, New greenfield master plan communities are built with up to 2,000 homes per square kilometre. The established suburbs in the middle rings of our cities have a density of around 750 homes per square kilometre. There is enormous potential here in the middle ring. A moderate increase in density focusing on mid-rise and terrace homes would make a significant difference in housing supply in a cost-effective way. I'm sure many of you will be aware in, in Auckland and New Zealand, they experimented with precisely that, allowing suburban lots to be subdivided and to build low and medium density, um, medium rise housing since 2016. Now the experiment is not without its critics to be fair, but what happened is that approvals for homes rose significantly as soon as that change was made to the legislation. Rent growth in Auckland was less than 4% per annum over uh, um, early 2019 to late 2022. Wellington, where they don't have those changes, is running more like 15%. We need to think about social and affordable housing as essential infrastructure, in the same way we think about schools and hospitals, not leaving this largely up to the private market to sort out. Indeed, this is a responsibility that needs to be shared between all levels of government and the private sector. Efficient, transparent, and certain developer contributions would make a significant difference, as would reducing state-by-state -state inconsistencies in regulatory regimes for community housing providers. Goes without saying that we need to adopt best, planning, um, best practice planning systems around the country. And in that regard, the reforms that have been recently announced by the Western Australian and Victorian governments are very welcome. We need to have a hard look at policies that stifle mobility. Stamp duty, for example, which is without doubt politically very challenging. And we need to accelerate in innovation in how we construct homes, harnessing modular construction to drive down cost. I am very encouraged by the new level of cooperation between state and federal governments, something I've never before seen in my career. It's clear that increasing housing supply is very firmly on the agenda. But the 1.2 million target is very ambitious. It will require delivering housing at a rate we have never before managed in this country. Significant reforms and also a fair bit of courage will be required if this is to be achieved. Our housing crisis is a collective problem that is in need of collective solutions harnessing all levels of government, the private sector and the not-for-profit sector. It's not an academic topic. It truly matters. And I fervently hope that we won't be here in another 15 years still talking about the same problem. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Susan. I'll ask John to give a, a, a brief response in a moment, and while he does that, can I suggest people who want to put questions in through the portal, start typing, well, they'll come through the app to me. Um, and for those who would like to, to ask a question directly using the microphones, put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. But first, John. 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here, and I certainly would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. Um, it's really interesting. Um, Susan and I shared this experience when we were talking about preparing for this, where we've both had the pleasure of spending some time in this fair state of Queensland just in the last few weeks, and we were staying, um, I was staying up near Proserpine, and, and Susan was in the, the islands as well. We talked about what it was like up there. Now, while I was there, I had the pleasure of spending some time with one of my nieces, who is a teacher. She's a maths and science teacher. She moved from Melbourne. She moved from Melbourne, and one of the absolute specific reasons why she moved was the cost of housing, and indeed it was recognised by a scheme under the Queensland Government where she's able to work as a teacher, have some of her housing subsidised. That subsidy, not, not a huge amount, but it was the material difference that's made it that she's able to now live there with her family and children and partner and establish herself as part of that community. Now I know, I'm a bit biased, she's one of the brightest people I know, a clever, you know, we much need them, STEM teacher. That community is really going to benefit from that. So when we think about housing, just echoing Susan's thoughts, one of the great themes of this conference, I think, it's not the exclamation mark, it's the and, it's the ampersand. We see it in the three themes. I think we need to continually think about, while we've got this alignment, and we clearly have it, and I'll come back to that with our minister, that housing and, it's housing and investment, it's housing and infrastructure, it's housing and communities, it's wellbeing and communities, it's innovation and collaboration, it's supply of affordable housing. So I think just, just as a, you know, taking stock, we're very fortunate to be at a time brought about by this conference where there's very little disagreement about a problem, rather the discussion and the negotiation is around the extent of the problem, how to best resolve it or what to do. So, so I think we're in really blessed times. We, we see all the planets aligning. Yesterday we had the great pleasure of having our National Shelter AGM and Minister Collins was able to address it and we handed her a tea towel, which we'd been had kicking around for a number of years and we've reprinted them, but on the bottom of it, it says exactly what Susan says, housing is a human right. So by starting with that premise and having this conversation at this conference, not be apologetic about that. Not only is it a good thing, it actually keeps us in line with our international obligations around this issue. So just to start with a few things, thank you very much, Susan. It's, it's actually really lovely and refreshing, again, to hear people talk about housing in such a, a unified way and what we need to do about it. But I think the real challenge for this conference and for all of us is to use the ampersand. It's always and. What else can we do? Um, yesterday, just to reflect on the minister again, she did it today, but yesterday uh, at our uh, event, it's, it's great to have a minister who, when they're talking about what the commitment has been over the last 18 months, that has to take a breath, that has to pause and say, we've done this and we've done that, and has to refer to the notes. Such is the nature and the commitment of the programs that we've seen. And, and we all agree there's some catch up that needs to happen, but I think it's very encouraging for all of us here to think that with, with that in mind, I would encourage people, and Susan certainly lent into this by talking about housing as a, a subjective need, not just an objective thing about investments and markets. These are people's homes. So with that in mind, I think the great conversations that will happen in the 40 or so sessions are around not having any sacred cows, not saying, well, that, that never worked, we tried that 20 years ago. Whether it's tiny homes or meanwhile use or all sorts of things. I think the great thing about this conference in particular, and through Michael's stewardship of Uhuri, that um, people are open to hearing not just what's working, but what hasn't worked, but what's worth trying again. So again, it's that and. Uh, a great, another thing that I think we need to sort of touch on as a theme, often we think about supply, and I think we all agree, and Susan said it as part of the council, it's of course it's supply, but it's not just supply alone, it's supply of the right types of housing in the right areas, and I think often if we only couch housing in terms of affordability, which can be objectively measured, we can see percentages of people who are renting and who are experiencing housing stress, we can lose the really important, for many of us in the room, the subjective lens that we need to look through. Because when we talk about housing that's affordable, if it's not also high in amenity, accessible, appropriate to people's needs, that they have agency over, it can just be a single, uh, a single point of failure. And I think with that, what we don't want to do, and we've certainly started to hear the rumblings of this, I don't think we should uh, confuse affordable housing necessarily with low cost construction and less of a product. Amenity is really important. In fact, all of those A's are. So again, appropriate, affordable, accessible, and for people to have agency over. Just finally, I think what's probably important is that these discussions shouldn't just happen within a context of welfare. Susan's right to talk about, and again, we had the conversation around uh, negative gearing and capital gains. 
Those two things are often seen as, as two elements, but in fact they have separate discussions, and I'm glad to hear another one that really should be um, open for discussion, is the extent to which in my state at least, in New South Wales, we made a record nearly $10 billion in stamp duty in the last year, mostly from domestic um, properties, and we've seen an additional, because of the uh, frenetic activity of houses being traded, nearly $10 billion will be created over the next four years. So it's okay to have the conversation saying, you know, economists and uh, tax people don't like it, it's called a provocation, but there's nothing wrong with suggesting that if one area of the property market is doing particularly well, and we all recognise that other areas of complex property market is failing or falling short, it's okay to be able to have robust discussions about what to do. Just finally, I might just say, we often hear about uh, these languages of moving forward and it's a great stride and taking steps and it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. I think I've decided the analogy that might work for this particular conference, when it comes to the threes, so the community sector, private sector and government, government in particular, there's the Commonwealth government, very committed, all our various state governments committed, and also local government. I think rather than a marathon, let's call it a triathlon. And each of those areas of government, pick which one you like, has a responsibility for, for delivering on, on their particular area. Given the amount of language I hear about the levers and gears, I suggest the Commonwealth might be the one that's the bike, but anyway. Um, <laughs> it is definitely great times, and I thank everyone here for coming, your commitment and your time. And, and I think one of the things just to finish is, is the sessions are so important, but so too is the dialogue in real time that you can have we, of course, um, encourage people who are online to participate as much as possible. But being in the room, having conversations with each other, no sacred cows, making sure that you're really uh, coming away from this conference with new ideas, new energy, new passion. I think we're at such blessed times in, in, in history when it comes to being able to do something about it. We look forward to a wonderful conference. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, John. We now have a chance for, for questions from the audience, uh, either through the app or, or by a microphone. Just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. If we could perhaps raise the house lights a little bit, there are some dark corners where I can't actually see people, um, would be helpful. But uh, just raise a hand. There's a, one over this way, I believe. Was there a hand over there that I see? I thought, yes, over there. Down in the second row. Microphone coming to you. And to save you introducing yourself, Kate Colvin from Homelessness Australia. Thanks, Michael. Um, my question is to Susan. I really appreciated your comments and, and the great work that you're doing focusing on the important issue of housing supply. But I'm just wondering if you can comment um, in relation to build to rent on the criticisms of corporate, really big corporate landlords like Blackstone in other countries. And I think the previous UN housing rapporteur you know, made some particularly strong comments about the exploitation of renters, the massive increases in rents, and, uh, you know, a whole series of exploitative practices by really big asset managers and corporate landlords. And so how do we expand institutional investment in rental housing in Australia but not have those same pitfalls? I, th I think that is a very good observation. And I, I think as, a, as we grow the sector here in Australia, which... Uh, which we certainly are, and in my, my, my Mervac life, we invested a billion dollars into uh, starting the build to rent sector at scale uh, for Australian renters. And I, I would say that it's um, in, the, in the same way that we have managed in this country to develop real estate sectors that are, have got good connections and relationships between customers and landlords, um, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but there, there is definitely an incentive for. Um, for landlords and owners um, to treat their customers well. If you treat your customers well, they stay. And that's the point of the income security that comes through through build to rent. And, um, and so I think it is important as we're developing this sector that we don't allow it to come, become exploitative. Um, but exploitation of renters isn't limited to institutions. Uh, it's, it also happens when individuals are renting out um, apartments to, um, to individual customers, where, which is a far less secure form of rental housing. So it's a very good, good and well-made comment that we, we need to make sure that there are the right rules and regulations put in place to ensure that, that landlords of all types, individuals and institutions, um, are not in a, a position to be able to exploit um, their customers. Thank you. There was a second question up here. Thank you. Karen Janicewski. I'm on the board of Unity Housing. But I'm also on the board of Melbourne Polytechnic, which is one of the large TAFEs in Victoria. Um, 
I suppose my question is, I think these targets are fantastic about housing and getting more housing, but as Susan would know, who's going to build it and what programs do we have in place to get more people into the construction industry, whether that's certificates in modular building or trades, because I know our TAFE could fill those places multiple times over, but we don't get funding. So I'm interested in what your thoughts are on how we might solve what is a large portion of the puzzle. Yeah, it is an important part of the puzzle because we definitely have got skills shortages that are coming from um, having had borders closed for a number of years and from um, a lack of e uh, education and credentialing in sectors that are, um, that are required. And at the same time, uh, we've got a, a very significant increase in construction company insolvencies um, due to, um, to rising costs in, in the supply chain, which have been very damaging for um, a, a very large number of construction companies. Um, I, I know that uh, the Business Council of Australia has been calling for some years for more micro-credentialing, more focus on TAFE, uh, to make sure that we've got the appropriate skills. And of course, the uh, appropriate skilled migration is also clearly very important to be able to ensure that we do have the, the resources, because it's, it, you're quite right. It's one thing to have a, a nice target of 1.2 million homes, but who actually is going to build them? John, did you want to add to that? Uh, just, I think, in terms of uh, the, the general framework that we've got, and again, this is the right conference to be having this conversation. Economists will always tell us if we just look at supply-side right, so, supply responses for anything, we're looking at half the picture. So I think to complement that, whether it's about TAFE or being able to fulfil shifts in aged care facilities and childcare, we need to look at demand as well. So I think that's probably just a, a good theme for this conference. To be able to complement the work of the Supply Council implicitly means let's looking at some of the demand drivers. So what are the skills... Uh, what are the positions that TAFE's not being filled for? What are the reasons, apart from your funding one, what are the things that they competing with? What are some other ways that we could support greater TAFEs in regional areas? You know, there's often an argument we have too many people in Australia living in too few cities. We have this demand where we're competing for labour, resources, skills. There's a whole other discussion that can also have and needs to happen that economists will tell us about around demand side as well. That's a good point, actually, because Australia has a very unusual urban structure. Um, so we've got big cities and small towns and nothing in between, and uh, or very little in, in between. And so that creates its own particular unique urban challenges, I think, in this country compared to um, a country like the US or even uh, the UK, for example, where there are um, multiple yeah. um, livable, decent-sized cities and not concentrated in, in a handful. I'll come to another question from the floor in a moment. But before I do, one of the questions that come through on the app, um, I'm going to paraphrase slightly because you, you can't really speak on behalf of the federal government, but no. there's an elephant in the room when it comes to supply looking at existing housing stock. Um, it's the short-stay housing sector which removes existing housing from the private rental market. Um, an, interim, an, inter, an, an interim embargo <laughs> on entire homes being rented out on, on those, those online platforms might help here that's similar to the New York model recently where, where new rules have come in where entire properties can't be let out on, on Airbnb and the like, but instead only rooms within it and the host must be present, staying there at the same time. Um, is that something that the council has looked at at all? Um, so the council has not considered the impact yet of sh um, short-stay accommodation on um, removing housing supply from the market. Uh, but it does go, I think, it is something I, I think we should put on the, on the agenda because it's a not insignificant reduction in existing housing supply, taking it away from the ability for families um, to, to own or live in accommodation. Nobody really knows the, uh, the depth of the problem. Um, it, it's quite significant in, um, in some coastal towns. It's certainly significant in inner Sydney and inner Melbourne, but nobody has done really the detailed work to have a look at what are actually, what, how large is that problem and what is the genuine impact on the availability of, um, of housing for people to, to live in on a, a secure long-term basis. And I think it goes to the point that making better use of the existing infrastructure that we have in the middle ring is really important. 
Now, uh, it's very expensive to build out, and it's very expensive to build up, but we've got housing stock, which is suffering from uh, being taken out of the market from short-term rentals. We've got, uh, as, as I said, there are policies that certainly uh, stifle mobility so that you've got people living in six-bedroom houses with, with no incentive to, uh, to downsize um, because of the insecurity of where they might go. Um, that is stopping that house being used for, um, for, for a family that could maybe use the six bedrooms. Um, so there's a whole load of things about the, the middle ring, which uh, there's latent demand in there and a small shift in density and better usage of existing stock would make a big difference, I think. John, is this something? Uh, just very quickly about short-term rentals. So, so two things, we need to regulate that market. I think that's what we've seen. So there's a difference between renting out a room occasionally, you know, even you know, four weeks or five weeks, when you're talking about enterprise-grade commercial use of a, another sector, it's right that there should be the certainty, the regulation, and, and the um, uh, a system to, that, that ensures um, that's delivered well. The analogy you might use is, you know, I've, I've lived in you know, Sydney occasionally, lived in a great terrace house. I, I might like to cook, but if I cooked every night and turned that into a restaurant, I'd expect the local council to apply the same standards that would be applying to a restaurant. So I suppose that's the difference. We're not just talking about an informal thing. We're talking about enterprise-grade commercial use of spaces. The other thing I would say, though, and I think it does hinge on this, we in this field often do spaces really well. We understand whether they're middle ring, up, out, density. The temporal dimension must not be ignored. And the reason why I say that is one of the things that the short-term rental accommodation seems to pivot on is are we talking 60 days, 90 days, 180 days? That seems to be the material difference because we certainly don't want to be quashing the opportunity for coastal towns to be able to thrive and have good tourism, but we certainly want to make sure the people who are essential workers to make that town work for the tourism have somewhere to stay and aren't travelling three and four hours to get there for moderate wages, out of hours, for you know, irregular casual shifts. So I suppose it's the balance. The temporal thing, and the reason why I say it, it's great that the Commonwealth not only talks about rental now, it also talks about inclusionary zoning. We, I think, in this room have the challenge to make sure when, when we talk about, for example, and NRAS, and for those of us that have been around long enough to remember, 10 years, even 15 years, comes around very quickly. 15 years ago, Obama was, was elected as President of the United States. It goes very quickly. So for us, advocating for what's the best solution in terms of security, not just affordability, is how can we make as much of the stock that gets leveraged through zoning or planning incentives in perpetuity? That really is for us, it's the gold standard. It stays on the books, it's an investment. It, it, it allows people with the security to say, well, that property, if it's a social or affordable housing, is mine for as long as I need it. They're not turning over because the program comes to an end. I think a real challenge for us is to understand not just spatially, but temporally what's needed. That's a, that is a very good point. And I, I think um, inclusionary zoning and, and some ways to level the playing field to allow, um, allow the creation of investment grade and with suitable returns, uh, affordable housing in, at scale is, is really important. And you might be aware that here in Queensland, the Queensland government set up a, a very, very simple program where they called for proponents who had uh, build-to-rent developments ready to go um, to come forward and to apply for um, a subsidy to provide 25% of the apartments at a 25% discount to, to market rent for key workers who already live in that catchment. That's it. Really, really simple. And that was enough for Mervac here in Brisbane to, um, to create a build-to-rent um, called, called Live Anura, it's at Newstead, which has 25% of the apartments that are uh, designated affordable. And what I love about that is that, um, that nobody knows who's the affordable tenant. It isn't the basement and you're going in a separate door. It's, it's, the, it's the person which is paying the rent, not, not the apartment itself. And if the circumstances change, they can move to a market rent um, and so forth without having to, to change buildings even. It's a super, super simple problem to, that can be solved here. Um, and the, all it took was the Queensland government to make a 15-year subsidy, and that made it economic for Mervac to make that choice um, to uh, create 25% of those apartments. Um, same quality, same Mervac quality, same access to the same amenity, um, but taking housing stress away from people who are already living in the catchment, um, but just they can live with better, um, with less housing stress. And while we're on the topic of affordable, I would be, I would love for us to change the definition of what affordable housing is, because you know we talk about affordable housing is a 15 or 20 or 25 percent discount to market rent. That doesn't make it affordable; it just makes it less than market. 
And when market's going up at 10, 15 um, percent, yeah, okay. I like to use the word affordable in its English language sense, which people can afford to pay the rent, not a technical definition of discount to market. We should consider that done. <laughs> I, I, I think there's furious agreement on that point. <laughs> we have a question down the front. Just for Susan. Can you hear me? Yep. Alexi Hamilton Smith from the ABC. Um, Susan, so Airbnb was one of my, my big questions. Also, the million houses the last census found that in Australia are empty. What's your view about those? Um, and we understand quite a few are owned by foreign investors. It's their right to, uh, or it's anyone's right not to rent your home out. Um, and secondly, we have been covering as journalists this story post COVID, particularly a lot and with a lot of heartbreak that we've seen. One of the things that I did, I want to know what your view is. These guys are listening to this today online. A uh, former academic who's living on the street, an IT expert, marriage broke up post COVID. Uh, used all his money, had some mental health issues, couldn't afford to rent, ended up also living on the street. Um, people that we've never, as you know, seen before, what do you say to them when all, we know we're going to keep hearing during this conference is that it'll be a decade or more to fix this crisis? Um, there's, quite a, there's quite a lot in, in all of that. Um, uh, that's, it's a heartbreaking thing to think about. I, actually, in my family, there's homelessness in my, in my family. It's a, a, it's a very complex problem to solve. And as you say, it can be triggered by um, health issues or a divorce or a lack of a job. Uh, it's, so I, I just have a lot of emotion around that and no, no good answer to say we, we need to do better. One idea that, and this is a, a personal idea uh, of mine, is that there, there, I think there is a way to build good quality, very fast modular construction that could be used to alleviate homelessness very quickly. Uh, good example in a different sector. Uh, during COVID, a company called Spacecube, which is a startup in modular construction, they do quite fun things like um, they, they provide the Ferrari, uh, the, the, the Ferrari facility at the F1, for example. Clearly, there was no F1 for a while, so they're like, hmm, what are we gonna do? And they built a hospital, a COVID hospital in Melbourne in a week a high quality hospital in a week using this modular construction. Why can't we find government land and build using that type of technology, which is well proven, um, build very quickly crisis accommodation to get people off the street? I think that's perfectly do doable. Uh, just very quickly to respond to that as well, to Lexi Hamilton-Smith, yeah, we, we certainly, um, agree that you can't have these conversations just talking about either incomes or assets or housing. I think we need to talk about superannuation, particularly in a gendered way. We have a very uh, inelegant way that we've dealt with superannuation, particularly for older women, so I think that's, that's on the thing. Um, in terms of the modular thing, so, so New South Wales government has committed in its budget a few weeks ago to investigating this, the, the idea of modular homes. I suppose at the end of the day, what we'd always want to make sure is that amenity question, that we're delivering stock that is as good as. We, we shouldn't have to say, so, so we all agree the market falls short, we say that in polite company, but here we can say the market fails. It fails repeatedly in particular groups, and, and whether it's floods or fire, we know that. So the idea of the modulars, I think we just need to always be making sure that we're not that if we're looking to market failure, we, we don't just look quickly look to what the market will do as the solution. There's a bit of a paradox there. So we'd want to make sure that whatever modular designs get, get built and delivered, and we're certainly encouraging New South Wales government to do this on some uh, surplus land that they have, even larger blocks that they've got in existing suburbs, that it's the same quality and standard. To the extent to which you can have better design uh, for accessibility and for environmental, we're all for it. But I think we just want to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of thinking about the demountable schools that we see everywhere, that, that could be, the, I think, the tension point. We've got to make sure it looks permanent as well as is permanent. It, it's a good, a good point, because I think when we think about modular housing, you think, um, I, I, my, immediately what comes into my head is those horrible demountable classrooms that we yeah. used to have to be educated in. That's not what yeah. I'm talking about at all. Uh, I'm talking about, for example, um, in, with, my, with my old Novak hat on, we did a, a fantastic experiment in Melbourne where we built 12 terrace homes using the traditional methodology and 12 terrace homes in a modular construction, and we measured the reduction in waste, the, the improvement in sustainability, um, the, the movement of trucks on site, the amount of dust on site. All of those things were dramatically better in the modular construction which was built in a controlled environment in a factory, brought to site and assembled. Same quality, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. If I took you to those two terraces, you would not be able to point out which was which. Same cost, same quality, 
but a whole host of benefits around it. And Mervac now does every single bathroom in every single apartment and every single home is modular. It's built here yeah. in, um, in Melbourne. And not here, we're in Brisbane, but it's in Australia, <laughs> in Melbourne, um, the, uh, a whole manufacturing industry around um, modular bathrooms. And you would not be able to tell uh, that it was basically craned in, all wrapped up, everything in it, unwrap it, bathroom. Fantastic. Convention centres are a special place and it's very hard to tell which city you're in at times. We have a couple of questions up in, in this quarter. Is this on? Oh. Uh, yeah, my name's John Evans. I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor in Indigenous Engagement at Swinburne University. Uh, we're in the process of establishing an Indigenous Building Co-Fabrication Centre. My question is, is that uh, how do you see support for emerging technologies in building, given that we're looking at 1.2 million homes in five years, and if we rely on traditional building systems, we're not going to meet that target? Yeah, I think innovation in the housing sector is absolutely ready for it. We largely build the same way that we've built for the last 50 years. It absolutely uh, is a whole ecosystem of tech startups that are around construction and uh, real estate uh, technologies. There's a, a whole fund that has been in, invested in, uh, which is supporting those technology companies around things, uh, around things like um, uh, how, how we can build better digital twins, how we can build mo better modular construction, uh, all, all sorts of different innovations, but it, it is absolutely ready for innovation in the construction sector because I think if we, we try and build 1.2 million homes, we've got the issue of the skills shortage for a start, but we've uh, actually got the, uh, the physical requirement to build a home in the same way we've done for the last 50 years absolutely has to change. It's not that easy to change because it, uh, it requires scale to make these, some of these things viable, but there, there is a significant amount of investment in startups in the construction tech space. As the microphone makes its way back over, over there, I'm going to take a question through from the app, though, and I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to shorten it because we're, we're starting to run low on time, and, and just simply ask, why not rent to buy? Right, rent to buy, yep, absolutely. So that, um, with my Mervac hat on again, and we did all sorts of different schemes. So we've done rent to buy. We did, uh, we ring fenced some uh, some apartments in well, when there was a huge amount of foreign investment. We ring fenced some apartments so you, for if you were an Australian first home buyer, you got the, you got in the queue first. So rent to buy, I think, is a very good solution, and shared equity is a good solution. Um, I think innovating around equity and how people can have fractional ownership, for example, is something that we need to think about so that that's an area for, for innovation as well, as, as well as housing typologies, uh, so that we're thinking about um, smaller homes or shared amenity or almost like student accommodation for grown-ups as a, as a concept. Why not? Uh, so that I think uh, uh, all, all of the above. Uh, my response to that would be that, yeah, in New South Wales, my, my home state, um, the government there had a great history of building large numbers of estates, uh, modest product that was built relatively quickly, standardised pattern of design, and then selling it to the existing tenants. Like that, that, that was a proven path in the case of New South Wales Housing. They did that. So, so that idea that it's new, I think it's probably new in application now. I think we should probably just be, be confident enough to say that our various state, um, uh, in, in the case of New South Wales Landcom, the government does have a development arm as well. And I think it, um, the question was raised recently about, well, should all the development be done privately? The, the land common in New South Wales is capable of not just doing the same, doing things differently, and indeed possibly acting counter-cyclically. So I know Scott from St George Community Housing, a number of other organisations, talk about this way that you can meet the market or where the market falls short, where there is a downturn, not that we're looking like one any time soon, but certainly the state's own development arms and construction areas are well versed at being able to answer that, and a build-to-rent product could be also supplied through government. We had a question over here. Uh, thank you. Russ from Latitude Network. Um, the tax system. We, we need a, a, a mature but robust discussion about the tax system, surely. I wonder, Susan, whether you'd talk about that. These norms that, that, uh, that, that are with us, they, they, ha they generate over generations. Um, we're continually disappointed, I think, or I certainly am, about the regularity with which we talk about reforming the tax system. And I'm not sure we're going to get to the uh, solution here without it. How do we have that mature debate about the tax system supporting the generation or the transition of these norms to what we are going to need in a generation's time? It's a, it's, it's a very good question. And uh, last time I waded into this topic, I found myself on rear window in the, in the financial review. Um, and I am not a taxation expert, nor a policy expert, nor an economist. Um, but I think that uh, the 
the ability to have in this country a, a grown-up conversation around big, difficult topics, it shouldn't be beyond us. Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of different questions on the app there that I'm going to blend into one. The first, first of it is one talking about tiny homes and should councils be doing more to support people putting tiny homes you know, in backyards or, or on private land. Um, South Australia, is, there's, there's been um, the idea floated around putting granny flats on the rental market. It happened um, here in Queensland nearly a year ago. Um, in the ACT, there's a move to allow secondary dwellings on lots over a certain size, which is actually most of Canberra. Um, you know, the, the sort of secondary dwellings, tiny homes, granny flats, all of that sort of ne swirling sort of nexus of secondary dwellings. Should we be doing more in that space? Uh, I think that goes to the point of making better use of the middle, middle ring. Uh, middle ring already has jobs, it has amenity, it has transport, it has, has infrastructure, but the densities, as I was saying in my remarks, are 750 dwellings per square kilometre, not 2,000 dwellings per square kilometre. So there's a, there's a big latent demand. And, and what, what I think I'm talking about it is not bulldo bulldozing existing housing and, and building mid-rise, but it's making more effective use. Maybe of you know, lots of a certain size can have a secondary home on them. I think we should absolutely be doing more of that. John, anything to add on that one? Uh, the microphone just, makes just its to way. answer Susan's thing, absolutely. Um, I think the missing middle, the idea of secondary dwellings, in New South Wales, we have provisions for this. It makes a big difference. I think it answers not just under occupancy, but in terms of some of the local councils who are worried about what they can do. It's not, it's not the sexiest product in the world, but the idea of carving off part of a large 160 square metre property and making 60 square metres of an existing building, a secondary dwelling, you can do that in New South Wales, as well as secondary dwellings. I, I think it's, it, it all has merit. So yeah, again, we, we were just always, I, I don't want to be too um, light about this, but, but we've already had caravans around for a long time, so putting a pitched roof on a caravan and calling it a tiny house is, is lovely, but I think the real challenge is the land, access to the land, having that land that's usable and in perpetuity. Probably the final question, I think. Thanks. Um, Sophie Jordan from the City of Melbourne. Um, planning's getting a lot of attention and local government in particular is um, being perceived as putting the foot on the hose of housing supply. And I'm sure my local government colleagues in the room will agree that's maybe not a fair or accurate representation. Um, and that planning approvals don't always translate to dwelling completions. And in City of Melbourne alone, we have 20,000 approved dwellings that have not been constructed. So I'm wondering about what focus there is on compelling, supporting developers when it's not necessarily in their best interests to undercut themselves or bring dwellings to market at an unfavourable time. What focus is there on, for, you know, requiring this to happen? Um, yeah. I think that, that is a, a good point and that I, I don't think we understand very well the granularity of... Uh, of, of where supply is being inhibited by people land banking, for example, um, or deciding that it's not a favourable time um, to bring housing stock onto the market. But it, it seems, very, and again, I'm not an economist, but we, it, seems, it, it seems a very unusual feature of our market that we have such significant price growth and we don't get the supply response. We have very, very inelastic supply mm. response. And so my, my hypothesis is that the, the there is on the margin some land banking, but it's not the, the nub of the problem. Um, and I, I think that the, the planning reforms that have been, uh, that are starting to be talked about by the states and the interaction between states and, and local government um, at, at, around simple things like being able to access enough planets. Uh, so I, I think anybody who works in local government in this room uh, would, would agree that uh, actually having the resources to, uh, to do the planning approvals is, is a significant issue that needs to be addressed and that there are states that are better and worse at, uh, at planning regulation and uh, allowing some certainty and speed through the system. Um, but I do know that we can do things faster without compromising quality because we did it in COVID. So during COVID, there were flying squads in the New South Wales, not literally, obviously, but there was a flying squad of people in planning New South Wales that went around unblocking things that were blocked in the system because the transport people didn't speak to the water people, didn't speak to the road people, didn't speak to the heritage people. And so this thing went round and round and round inside New South Wales government. And they put together a team and they got all the stuff out of the door and then it got built. So I know we can do better at uh, providing uh, a much swifter planning response um, in to get the supply to be much more elastic to, d to demand. 
Just very quickly, um, uh, our Prime Minister talks about growing up in social housing. He started the narrative, and it was correct by saying he grew up in council housing. So the city of South Sydney built the property that he's, he was living in, still there. I think it's important that local council can see themselves as part of the solution, not just the, the, the gatekeeper. It's not all, you know, it's not all sticks, it's not all um, sticks, it can be carrots. And the reason why I say this is because we think about how some extraordinary local councils across the country, and if you sort of did a bit of a Frankenstein and add them all together, you get a great idea of councils can do great things from providing bonuses, of course, through formal planning or um, contribution scheme, but also offering land themselves. It doesn't have to be uh, given. It can be leased for a long period to community housing organisations. Councils often have car parks. So Dr Kim Horton, who I know is presenting here at the conference, often says, what, what would make a huge difference in terms of what local councils can do? Particularly in regional areas where the land values uh, accord with this, councils often have car parks. They need affordable housing for key workers. Use your great community housing sector, well represented here at the conference. It's a bit of a no-brainer. So just to answer the thing, we get that councils are often seen as being uh, an impediment. Not only should they not be, they can actually be part of the solution, absolutely. Absolutely. On that note, I know there were lots of other questions, both in the app and, and other hands that we didn't get to. Apologies for that. We were a little late starting, but we're going to get back on time. Please join me in thanking Susan Lloyd Hurwitz and John Angler. Thank you. Thanks. This is really just the start of the conference. It's the scene setting session. So the good thing is you'll have a chance to speak to both of them and their colleagues over the next couple of days in the breaks. And we're going to morning tea. Thank you very much. <laughs>